Here, our little one, uh, we're expecting a second uh, a daughter, we found out a couple weeks ago, so we're excited for that. So, oh, thank you. You guys are too kind. Well, we're, uh, we both uh, grew up in Iowa, Michelle and I. We've been here down in Southern Illinois for, uh, uh, I guess it'd be just about eight months now, since the very first of the year, pretty much. I think we moved in on January 2nd was the, or no, we moved just before January 1st, pardon me. So we've been here for, uh, for that time, uh, been settling in. Uh, camp season has been going full swing for the past month, month and a half, and uh, we've really had we've had a challenging year at times, but a really good year, a blessed year. There's been wonderful things happening, and uh, there's a few faces of of some people that I recognize who've been at camp. So I'm glad to be here and have the opportunity to uh, to share God's word with you today. Uh, I don't I don't spend a whole lot of time plugging the camp, but uh, we we love having people who are involved. I've already spoke with a few of you who have served at camp, and as well as having the kids come out there so we look forward to to building those relationships with you as and we're looking I'm looking forward to really getting around to the churches and getting to know you guys so I appreciate again this opportunity we're going to be in God's word today and we'll get there in a moment but I want to start start us off by talking a little bit about about uh, the idea of a feud y'all familiar with what a feud is right I don't need a dictionary definition to explain to you what a feud looks like you can figure it out pretty well the picture that always comes to our minds, what's the two names that we know? The feud, the big one. Say again? The Hatfields and the McCoys. There's the, ones I, there's the one I heard. There's, there's, there's more than one of them. I was hoping someone wouldn't list a whole bunch of them. But, but feuds, the Hatfields and the McCoys are the big one. That one uh, happened in the 1800s, uh, basically in the post-Civil War, all, all the way up to the early 19 or, or to the to the end of that uh, year to the early 1900s and uh, there was a show a few years back that they did a little mini series on the Hatfields and McCoys uh, you know a feud involves a lot of different things a lot of different elements but basically typically it's two groups usually families of some sort that are going back and forth carrying on with each other uh, there's all sorts of stuff makes for good television doesn't it you know you've got murder intrigue romance you know all this this crazy stuff that goes into that and uh, and feuding something that's kind of Again, we're something we're familiar with, even if it isn't directly familiar with us. Now, I said I'm, I grew up in Iowa. My dad uh, is from up by Alton, Illinois, and my mom grew up in Middle Tennessee. And, uh, and we were separated for a variety of reasons from, from her family and not very close to them, so we never visited a whole lot. But let's just say, coming from Iowa, going down to Middle Tennessee, sometimes things were a little bit different, uh, I would find out. And there's one time that I, we, we visited a relative who actually lived right on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Literally, literally, their sidewalk was, uh, you crossed over into Tennessee, and they were on the, on the Kentucky, or no, they were on the Tennessee side, but if you crossed uh, north there, you'd go over to Kentucky. And so they, uh, they grew up right there, and, and I, I don't remember much even about the relative's house. I remember they turned a closet into a bathroom, because as a kid, that's weird to you. Uh, and it was a closet that, you know, you'd stand up, and you'd turn, and you'd wash your hands, and then you'd open the door about there and you can get right out but there was no room you know it was like a it was no bigger than a port john but anyways this uh these relatives we we were down visiting them and uh and there was another relative we had out in the country down there and she said we're gonna go visit them and uh and so we drive out in the country and I, I again all these details that really don't have anything to do with the story but we passed i remember seeing this road that was named bill nanny road and we passed it four or five times so i don't know if every road in the country there was named bill nanny road or if it just went like this across the road we were driving but we just kept crossing it and we got down and we were getting closer and she she goes well she says be careful when you come up to the front door this is to my mom and this is at night by the way it's dark and she says to my mom, be careful coming up to the front door. They're feuding. They're feuding. And she said, yeah, I'll probably greet you with a gun. So, you know, just so you're aware of that and make sure, you know, you're real clear on who you are. And we get into this, this yard and there's like three or four Rottweilers. It's dark. We comes to find out no one's there. So we didn't, you know, we didn't continue to feud or anything. And they weren't feuding with us. But it's one of those things where, you know, you think, you think that kind of stuff is done. But it still happens. I couldn't believe she actually said to us that, oh, they're, they're feuding with someone else. But you know, the idea of a feud is this idea that, that you're opposed to some other group. There's nothing else they can do that's right. There's nothing that can fix that relationship. You're going to be fighting with each other. Certainly, when our, with our relationship with God, that's where we were. We were feuding with God. 
We were in rebellion against him. And that's where I want to take in, us into our passage today. And if you'll turn with me in, in Scripture to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in, uh, in chapter 5. And of course, 2 Corinthians is a second letter that we have of Paul that he wrote to, uh, to the Corinthian church. And if you know much about the Corinthian church, they're a mess. Uh, you know, I always, uh, I had a pastor in, uh, or a, pre, a teacher, pardon me, in, in college who would always talk about, you know, in the, we're in the restoration movement. We want to restore to the New Testament church, but you don't want to restore to the first Corinthian New Testament church because man, they were messed up and they had all sorts of problems, but Paul's writing. And, and after he dealt with a lot of stuff in first Corinthians and second Corinthians, he really is writing in a different tone, a different manner. But in Corinthians chapter five, getting near the end of the chapter, I'm going to start in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. We start with our verse, and I'm, I'm going to stop as we go along and make some observations. We start with the therefore, with a moving from one thought to another and transitioning uh, to what we're, Paul's talking about here. And that therefore, if you go and look previous in the chapter uh, of chapter 5, talking about uh, the heavenly dwelling versus our earthly dwelling, our earthly body versus our heavenly body. You know that someday we will have this, uh, we will be with the Lord and, and things will be done away with. And then talking again about how as apostles, they have this ministry then of, of communicating this gospel to people. And so now he's transitioning and saying, okay, so we're talking about old and new and we got to talk about what that looks like. So the therefore is moving to that, uh, to the new creation, as it says here, or new creatures is really the same word, the idea. And that, and that idea is all throughout scripture. Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19 says this, the Lord says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The Lord has always been about making things new. The Bible I carried through high school and through college had a little note that sat in the back of it, uh, just taped to the back of my Bible from my mother, and it said, uh, it said this, if you don't deal with your past, it's gonna walk with you in the, or in the present and it's gonna color your future. And then that's the truth. Isn't that what a feud's all about? A feud is all about the old things. Because whoever you're fighting against, man, they did this, 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 and this, and there are no good this, 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 and this when you're walking right now, and that's going to change the decisions that you make in the future because you're at war, you're feuding with them. And so that's the, the Paul's talking about, though, a new thing. And let's go on with verse 18. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So all these things, or, or as it says here, all this is from God. All this, this new creation is from the Lord. And what has he given us? According to Paul, he's giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Now that word reconciliation is a big word. It's a good word. It brings to mind a couple different images, uh, certainly in, in the ancient time as well as today. Reconciliation is obviously about the restoration of relationship, of bringing people together, of reconciling. It also brings the image of, of nations reconciling after war. It also brings the, the image of a king who's bringing in someone who's rebelled against him and reconciling that relationship to the proper stature and the proper uh, place. But you know, with reconciliation, as with feuding, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? You can't do it one-on-one. -on -one. You can't have a good feud without someone to feud against. So the thing is, if you're going to have a relationship where that, that's uh, broken, you know, you're going to have two people that did things to break that. If you're going to have a war, it's, it's two nations to fight. If you're going to have a king and a, and, a, and a rebellion, you know, there's something, there's something that both have done that has caused that split. But again, with reconciliation, it also takes two to tango. You're going to have to have both of you come together and reconcile that relationship. You're going to have to have the two nations sit down at peace talks or accords of some work, some sort of agreement out. And you're also going to have to have the king and the subject come together. But the other thing with that, although it takes two, it really takes one, if you think about it, to begin the process of reconciliation. A feud stops when one side decides the feud stops. It ends here. 
Certainly with our relationships, it takes one person to begin initiating that process of reconciliation. With two nations, if it's a, a nation who was aggressive and warlike and had done things against the other one, they have to take some steps to repair that. And certainly with a king and a, and a ruler where you've rebelled against him, you've got to show some signs of reformation before you get there. There's a lot of R's there. They told me not to do that in Bible college. They said, always avoid alliteration. That's a good one. I don't know if you got that one there. But the thing is, that's what the Lord has given us, is this ministry of reconciliation. The feud is done. The fight's done. And it wasn't done the, the way the world has does it, where you fight it out to the end, to the last man standing. It's done the way that Jesus did it, by defeating death. So let's continue on with that. 18 gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ and not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. You notice uh, through here, it's interesting, if, uh, the, the phrase uh, referring to Christ. Verse 17, it talks about being in Christ, you're a new creation. Then it talks in 18 uh, that God reconciled the world through Christ, through the work that he did. That's what ended it. And then ultimately now again, when you are in Christ, you are committed, uh, or you're, you're in Christ, your sins no longer count against you. So that's, uh, I, I, get, I hope that makes sense to you. But the word counting here, I, I love this, the word counting for uh, your sins against you is, is the ancient word for keeping track, for keeping a record. It's, it's the, the word of an accountant of sorts who would keep track of the debit and credit, you know, what's on your account, and you have that ledger. It's also the word we get that refers to how kings would keep their records on certain individuals. Think back to the story of Esther, and the story of Esther, Xerxes would like to read those records back where he would talk about the good and the bad, you know, and the, and the, the people, the important people in this kingdom and either the good or the bad things that they had done. And so that's, uh, that's something that we have in mind here, that those things are kept track of and are counted. But the thing is, our king doesn't count the way everyone else counts. Once you're in Christ, those sins no longer count against you. And that is incredible. That's incredible right there. But going on again in verse 20, he says, okay, then we, we actually in 19, before we go, he's given us this message then, the message of reconciliation. That's the message of the gospel. Certainly that in Christ Jesus, he has come to this earth. He lived, he died, he rose again, and now bears our sins and reconciles us to God. We no longer have to fight with the Lord. We don't have to be at odds and at enmity with God. And so going on in verse 20 then, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. So the term for what we now have is that of an ambassador. Now I, I graduated from Ozark Christian College and Ozark's logo, or, uh, or not logo, mascot, that's the word, mascot for their sports teams was the ambassadors. So, you know, I guess I can, I have some credibility talking about it. By the way, whenever Bible colleges pick, pick mascots, this is why they don't put me in charge because I would pick something different. Cause you got like Ozarks, the ambassadors, uh, Nebraska Christian was known as the Parsons, which always got me. I think St. Louis is the soldiers. You know, they wouldn't put me in charge cause I'd be like, ah, we're the Ozark Christian college blue devils. And then they'd be like, what, what have you done? But our logo, surprisingly, the, for the ambassadors, looks like that. But the idea of an ambassador is that you are a representative of one person, one kingdom, one place over here, in another place. So you're supposed to be speaking and doing what they want done over here in this place where you are now. The thing is, uh, as an as a ambassador, you have to be cautious. It's not a job for the careless. Because you are given a task, you're given a culture to be a part of and to participate in, but you're not to be in it the way everyone else is. Because you have to represent someone else. When you are there as an ambassador, you speak for the people over there. You act for the people over there. And one one little slip up in how you speak, one little mistake in how you act affects the relations and the representation that you have of the other kingdom. We are ambassadors. 
We are not part of this world. We are not a part of the kingdoms of, of the world. Thank goodness. Thank God that we have been saved and rescued from that. But now we have a task to be Christ's ambassadors. And it says here as if God himself were making an appeal through us. Now, if you're like me, you start to feel a little nervous here. You start feeling that little clutching in your throat. You start to feel your heart beat a little bit more. Maybe your back sweating. You know, no one else can see that. But you can feel, you know, you're nervous. Being an ambassador of Christ is a nerve-wracking thing. It's, it's something that at its front and at, at the first thing we look at is scary because we speak for Jesus. We speak for God. We act for them while we're here on this earth. And Paul, of course, speaking here, has been an ambassador, not just here to the, to the Corinthian church, but through the churches throughout the region. And as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We are to be these kind of ambassadors. This church is an embassy. It's an embassy in the middle of the kingdom of this world. So going on then, and uh, finishing uh, out what we'll be talking to today in, in, uh, in the last part of this verse, then he says this, we implore you on Christ's behalf. No other God pleads with people. No other God desires to be reconciled the way that God desires to be reconciled. In the ancient world, in the pagan world, certainly your gods were these wishy-washy de deities that did your own thing, and you had to do certain things at certain times of the year in certain ways, and you had to pacify them. Our gods today are no different. Our gods of power, of pleasure, of lust, of greed, the things that really control this present world are not gods that are trying to plead with you. They'll run you over. They'll, they'll have their way with you. But God is desiring that we plead with men and women to be reconciled to him. So as we've gone through this text, I've just had a few verses here that, uh, of 17 through 20 that were really laid on my heart. Where do we go now? As I was reading about this, you know, there's, there's a variety of ways we could go. We could talk about how great it is that the Lord has reconciled us to him. That's wonderful. We can go the theological route. Oh man, there's all sorts of stuff there. I, I read commentaries and listened to guys, you know, spend 40 minutes talking about all the little deep intricacies of here. But there's something that really came, came through to me and, and, and on my heart as I was, as I was thinking about this passage and this, and that's this, who are we feuding with? Who are we fighting with? Because here's the thing. Even though we're in Christ, even though through Christ we've been reconciled to God, we oftentimes carry on with the feuds all around us in this world. You know, this is not the little things. I, I mentioned little things because this is actually a pretty big thing. We, uh, I love BLTs, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches. Oh, and that's like the summertime. That is the food of July. That's the official food of July. So we came to that this week, where it's the first BLTs of the summer. Oh, big deal. And here I am, and I'm piling up bacon on my sandwich. I'm making it. And my wife, she goes, she's laughing back here now. I'm telling on her. She goes, you're not going to eat all that bacon, are you? Yes. Why wouldn't I? And she goes, well, we're going to eat a whole pound of bacon if you do that. Correct. Yes, what's the problem here? I don't see any I don't see any issue. That's what we're doing. We're eating bacon and putting lettuce and tomato and making a sandwich. You know, and it's one of those things where okay, so we had our little fight there. You know, we had our disagreement on how much bacon you should eat. But you know, in all seriousness, there are serious fights that we have with each other and serious feuds. You know, I know I know you're videoing this and I wish I could just ask you to censor this out, but uh in one of the ministries I was a part of that I didn't leave well, uh, and, and it was uh, through a variety of reasons. I, I remember shortly after leaving there, and I heard the news uh, that one of those uh, uh, members of the church that I had some disagreement with, uh, his wife had gotten cancer. And there was a part of my heart that said good. Oh. It's one of those things that hurts me to this day because it's not something I wish. It's not something I want. But you and I know that we still feud with each other. And it breaks my heart that so many churches and so many Christians leave behind them a trail of broken relationships when we are supposed to be representing the one who reconciles the world to him. 
And so as I, as I struggled with this and this idea of, of what I wanted to preach, I, didn't, I don't really have a witty or cunning saying. You know, sometimes you get that when you're preaching. You've got like a little thing that makes a great Facebook status. You can just go and put that online. That didn't happen to me this time. You know, if it's anything, it's like if you're feuding with somebody, stop it. You know, there's my sermon title. Cut it out. You're not supposed to be doing that. But the thing is, when we, when we desire to have that, that wittiness, sometimes it's not of the Lord because I don't need to be creative. His word speaks. I don't need to come up with something different. So I want to end uh, with a couple things that pertain to this and a couple passages that I want to read that talk about uh, what it means not just to be reconciled to God, but to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters. Turn with me in Matt to Matthew. We're going to be in the book of Matthew. The first is in chapter 5. And then if you want to get ahead and you're, you're one of those people, you want to go to Matthew 18 afterwards. But we're going to start in chapter 5. This is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which deals a lot with how we treat each other and how we interact with each other. And it says this in verse 23 of chapter 5. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your guilt there, or leave your gift there, pardon me, in front of the altar. Leave your guilt too. Uh, first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. I like that Jesus says something. He says, if you remember you, your brother has something against you. Because, man, if we came every Sunday and we had to deal with the things we have against other people, I guess I'd just dismiss you now to go out and deal with it. Because I know I, I wouldn't be allowed in church. I'm always, there's always something in my heart that I'm struggling with and trying to deal with against someone else. But this is whole idea. You cannot have the ministry of reconciliation when your relationships are broken. You can't. You can if you're not willing to do that and to live at peace with your brothers and sisters and to reconcile with them. You cannot say that you have a ministry of reconciliation and reconciling uh, others to the Lord. Now, again, I'm not saying here that there are not toxic and abusive relationships and, and things that you need to get out of and, and things that you need to be not be a part of. There are obviously things. And even in Scripture, we have clear directions on how we're supposed to deal with a brother. Matter of fact, in 18 later, it talks about how to deal with a brother who sins against you. Sometimes you have to break those relationships off. That's not to say that, but here's the thing. We all make the excuses. We all have, and you can hear them in your own head. Okay, you don't know how bad this person is. You don't know how stubborn this person is. You don't know how much they've hurt me, the things they've done. You don't know my story. And you're right, I don't. But those are the same excuses that I use. Those are the same things that I try to put to excuse myself from reconciling with my brothers and sisters when we're feuding with each other. And that's the thing. If you want a ministry of reconciliation, you've got to live it out, especially with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Go again with, uh, to Matthew 18, as I mentioned. And again, as I said, in verse 15, it talks about how a brother sins against you. So again, there is a way that times that we have to, to do that. But going on to verse 21, and this is a passage we're familiar with. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Pretty good number he gives. You know, seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, the goal here is that Jesus doesn't give a number in response. Is that, isn't that not true? He's not saying, hey, 70 times 7, that's the real number you should forgive someone and you should be counting that. I saw a little comic that was, you know, was the, the uh, apostle sitting around with Jesus and, and one of them saying, okay, not only now is, do we have to forgive people, which is tough, now we've got to do math on top of that. So that's not what he's talking about. He's abolishing the idea that we need to keep track of sins. Because that's the thing. You cannot preach that God doesn't count your sins if you're counting somebody else's sins. Because if you and I have a record, if we have that ledger of the good and the bad that everyone does to us, and we're keeping count of those things, how does that reflect on our Lord and Savior, who didn't count those things against us, but was willing to come and die on our behalf? And certainly, I, again, it's a tough thing to do. This is a tough thing to live out. I don't know that I can give you five easy steps for how to forgive someone, except that you're supposed to forgive them 70 times, seven times. I can tell you that much. But that's the thing. 
You can't preach that God doesn't count our sins like we talked about in Corinthians if you're counting other people's sins. And the last part, if we continue on here, and, uh, and without going through and telling the whole story, you can read it along as we go. The last thing that Jesus says on that matter is he gives a parable. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And it's the idea that a king then, a king who has his ledger book, has his accounts, brings in his servants and decides to settle one day. And one comes in who owes, I mean, just a ridiculous amount. Like, how did you get in this amount of debt amount? And this guy says, uh, he, he's there with the king, and the king says, uh, sorry, you owe this much. Really, the only way to pay for that is to go and sell you into slavery uh, and take you from what you're doing now. Sell your wife, sell your kids, get rid of all your stuff, and that's the only way to settle. This guy drops to his knees. He pleads. He says, I, I, can, I can pay this back. I can do this, which is audacious in and of itself. He cannot do that. And so the king, in his mercy, says, all right, he doesn't give him just the chance to go out and try to pay again. He doesn't give him a second chance. He gives him a clean slate. He says, it's done. The debt's done. So not, is, this guy is not given a second chance. Like I said, he is given a new life. And he goes free now as a free man, and he heads out. And as he's headed out from the king, uh, he sees another guy who owes him 10 bucks. And he comes up to that guy and he grabs him by the neck and says, says he, he, he's choking him, literally, saying, pay back the money that you owe me. Sitting there on the ground, you know, bouncing this guy's head against the dirt. Here he is carrying on with this guy now to pay him back. And this guy pleads with him and says, I'll, I'll pay it back, I'll pay it back. He says, no, you're going to do it now. You owe me $10 now. The king hears about this, brings this guy in and says, and I just, I, I can't imagine the scene. You know, you see where, where someone's sitting there like this. Oh, can you imagine? You have been forgiven a debt that is unforgivable. And you can't give this guy enough leeway for 10 bucks. And he sends him off and he, and he does what he says he's going to originally do. Because I had given you that new, that new life. And you didn't take that opportunity. Here's the thing. You and I cannot be an ambassador with our own agenda. Ambassadors do not have their own agenda. When we go back to our text in Corinthians, that God has given us a job to plead on behalf of him to men, be reconciled to God, we do not get to go around having our own little side projects and agendas. If you actually sent an ambassador, imagine sending an ambassador to a country that he didn't get along with any of the people there. That's a dumb decision because you're gonna, it's going to lead to problems. It's going to lead to conflict, maybe even war. If we cannot recognize what we have been given in Christ Jesus, that God does not count our sins, that he has created a new creation, we've been given life, and yet we carry on with our own things, our own fights, our own battles. We cannot be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. So really those are my things. You can't have a ministry of reconciliation if your relationships are broken. You can't say God doesn't count your sins against us if you're counting everyone else's sins. And you can't have your own agenda as an ambassador of Christ. Again, as, as, as we go forward now, what I pray for you and what I, I pray as we close today that if there is something that you need to, to reconcile, go be reconciled to that person. Take steps. It may not work out perfectly. That's not what you're called to do. You're called to be faithful and to preach and proclaim the reconciliation of Christ, not only of, of, of him, but us to all those around us and ultimately the world to the Lord when he comes back again. I want to go ahead and uh, close in prayer, and I thank you again for the opportunity to bring God's word to you today. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much uh, for the church here in Cesar. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the encouragement. Uh, the people here, I thank you for the encouragement of, uh, of some of the people on the board. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, David and, and, uh, and the encouragement he has blessed me with. I pray, Lord, over this church that you continue to bless them as they serve you in this community. I pray that they grow, uh, not for their own glory, but so that we continue to proclaim that you have reconciled us through Jesus Christ. Lord, give us that ministry of reconciliation. Lord, with the responsibility we have to heal the relationships, give us strength to do that so that we can ultimately worship you uh, with true hearts. We love you, Lord. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.